two deeply traumatized roommates who also happen to be hitmen adopt an adorable little girl. What could possibly go wrong? Buddy Daddies is an anime about two hitmen, Kuruzu Kazuki and Sua Rei, who end up accidentally adopting Unasaka Midi, the daughter of one of their targets, during a failed mission. After Midi's mother dismisses the possibility of taking her daughter into her care once again, Kazuki and Rei find themselves attached to the little girl and unable to leave Midi in someone else's care. The partners in crime attempt to settle into their parenting journey while grappling with their personal issues. Rei and his relationship with his abusive father, who raised him an assassin rather than a son, Kazuki and his neglected childhood as an orphan, and the circumstances of his late pregnant wife's passing. The heavy subjects don't impede the anime from being wholesome and at times quite funny. Buddy Daddies may not have reached an audience level compared to that of Spy Family, partially due to its shorter duration compared to the latter, but it certainly left a mark in entertainment media as a whole by capturing the importance of platonic relationships through the aromantic and asexual relationship between Kuruzu Kazuki and Sua Rei. After its finale, the anime was the target of criticism by some fans for not being queer enough, given that Kazuki and Rei were not explicitly shown to be romantically intertwined by the last episode. Some fans go as far as saying that the anime is also queer bait, given that Kazuki is shown to be somewhat of a womanizer in the sense that he'll slip around with women in order to gain information needed for their targets, and when he needs to unwind. By the last episode, it is implied that after years, he still occasionally meets with women for the same sexual purposes. Now, a lot of the reasoning behind why the anime is supposedly queerbait and that the relationship between Kazuki and Rei isn't queer enough doesn't sit right with me. I'll dissect it a little, but won't linger too much in favor of exploring their platonic relationship. The notion that in order for someone to be queer, they must show interest, both romantic and sexual, in solely the same gender, is blatantly erasing other sexualities. It leaves the same taste in my mouth when people will claim that bisexuals and pansexuals dating the opposite gender aren't actually queer. As if a bisexual woman being in a relationship with a man will erase the fact that she is bisexual for example. As for the blatant erasure and lack of care for aromantics and asexuals, by implying that their existence isn't queer enough. Humor me for a moment and tell me, why does the lack of interest in either sex or romance, or both, garner such strong reactions, whether it be anger or doubt? Why is it so controversial? Are we willing to ignore beliefs propagated to us for decades upon decades that sex and romance are necessary for you to achieve true happiness? Or that if you don't have sex with your loved one, or if you don't want to have sex with your loved one, then you don't actually love them, since sex is supposedly the ultimate expression of love. In fact, if you don't have a romantic partner, then you are doomed to a life filled with loneliness, and you certainly failed, because the love present in platonic relationships could never be as strong and unconditional as the love present in romantic relationships. Just saying this stuff makes me angry. If aromantics and asexuals aren't othered by society, then why are we often either infantilized, as though some of us aren't grown adults, or dehumanized, in the sense that people will treat us like robots, or otherworldly, as though we're gonna be inherently cold and unfeeling because we either don't want sex, or don't want romance, or we don't want both. 
Why would some of us be forced into coercive sex under the pretense that we'll be cured? The pretense that, well, it's the chosen one. It's the real one. It's the one you've been waiting for your whole life. Why would some of us go through sexual harassment based solely on the fact that you say you're not interested in sex and the immediate response is, well, then I'll prove you wrong. And I'm not going to be too descriptive, but you can imagine what often happens next. While, of course, aromantics and asexuals don't face the same level of legislative oppression of those who are LGBT, it is unrealistic to ignore the blatant social issues that lead to us feeling inadequate and undeserving of love and companionship. Please keep the aforementioned misconceptions and issues in mind as I turn the focus back on Buddy Daddies. While Buddy Daddies certainly has its faults, as many 12-episode animes usually do with commonly rushed and poorly handled endings, I don't believe that queer baiting and not being queer enough are on that list. The anime wasn't advertised as a romantic story and there were never any indications that it would become a romantic story as it was focusing more so on fitting within the found family trope. Allow me to add a quick note here that I've noticed that there seemed to be a rise in people applying traditional roles to the found family trope and I believe that part of the reason for the backlash that buddy daddy's got is the misconception that in order for you to properly raise your child the parents must be romantically intertwined and must fit within mother and father roles and i'm not saying like stop applying traditional roles to found family do what makes you happy in fact buddy daddy's plays with and makes fun of the very idea so I feel like when it, it fits within the story, whether it be a funny bit like Buddy Daddy's uh, did, or it's more so about like dynamics, I get it. You know, I get it. The urge to apply traditional roles. I'm just concerned that when doing so, it may affect the intended characterization or message that the show was trying to convey. You're not going to catch me complaining if you have had cannons. Like, uh, you're not going to catch me complaining about fanfics that fall within that role, okay? I am all for, you know, you can have your head cannons, you can have your fanfics, you can have your fan arts. Absolutely. I'm just concerned when people cannot separate the head cannon from the cannon. The anime would have also successfully tackled the common traditional belief held to this day that women have natural maternal instincts and that upon having an unwanted child, the mother will suddenly be willing to take on that responsibility and will love the child unconditionally. Had they not chosen the direction of Misaki entering their lives once again, seeking redemption before cancer ultimately results in her death. I view her mishandling as a testament that trying to fit within traditional roles may lead the writer and subsequently the character to a dead end. While I am not opposed to the fact that she cares for Midi, it would have been interesting if they kept her fear for Midi's life when she had realized what kind of work Kazuki and Rei are involved in and pointed out the hypocrisy of claiming they have Midi's happiness and well-being in mind while continuing to kill people for hire. Masaki pointing out the hypocrisy is not the issue, right? I think that the writers perhaps should have added her advocating for Midi to be put up for adoption, for her to have parents who aren't either neglectful or in a dangerous line of business, rather than suddenly giving her a redemption arc that focuses on her wanting to be a proper mother. Some people aren't mothers. And they'll never fill the innate role of a mother. As harsh as it may sound, that's normal. Because humans can't be put in boxes based solely on their gender. And to insist that a woman will undoubtedly 
tried to fit within a motherly role, even though she was shown not to care for it and, in fact, shown to hate it, is not a good message, in my opinion. Mothers aren't always good. Mothers aren't always warm. Mothers are capable of abandonment and neglect. Mothers may resent their child's birth. Mothers may care for their child, but they may not love their child. Before anything else, I am certainly not advocating for mothers to neglect their children, okay? I am not, like, saying this as if it's something... Uh, girl boss. <laughs> that literally makes me want to throw up. I am not advocating for that, okay? I am just pointing out that this is a reality that people live with and some people will have to live with. In fact, it's the reality that one of the characters in the show lives with. That he was abandoned and neglected by his parents. So mom and dad. And this is unfortunately a reality that people will have to live with if they have parents that were forced into the position that they clearly didn't want to and have no affinity to. People are free to disagree with me. By the way, this is my interpretation, okay? I am not putting a stamp of this is the only interpretation that you can have. And I realize that it may be a ruthless way of thinking and analyzing that Given that the anime was probably just trying to have a hopeful end on uh, Miri's mother, right? I just feel like it wasn't needed. Both in terms of what I think uh, about traditional roles uh, and uh, forcing that upon a mother. Which, when it's a father... It's crazy how expected it is, but when it's a mother, it's not. And I feel like that would have been an interesting message. You know, mothers can be abusive. On top of everything else, it didn't matter that she cared. It didn't matter that she was trying to have redemption because she got killed. Misaki got fridged. So you see how it, it starts to feel like it's a disservice to the story, to the narrative, to the character itself. Like, some characters are good because they are unforgivable. Anyway, they had it. They had it on that front, and then they ruined it. It's one of the mistakes in the endings that I feel like every 12-episode anime does. It's crazy. Traditional roles and rent aside, also, I'm sorry that the rent <laughs> took as long as it did. The anime is not queer bait, okay? Because their relationship is queer platonic. Even before Midi entered their lives, we get a glimpse of Kazuki and Rei's bond in episode 8, depicting the moment they met and the moment Kazuki decided to take care of Rei. The level of intimacy we are shown between both is enough to surpass any conversation or entire episodes dedicated solely to how their relationship blossomed. We are shown Kazuki taking on the seemingly insurmountable task of helping Rei rise from a depressive episode and, in the process, build a home for both of them. Kazuki introduces warmth, care, love, and stability to Rei's life without anyone forcing him to do so. Something else that I find worth mentioning here is that while Kazuki compares Rei to a robot, it is never tied to or implied to have any connection to Rei's lack of interest in romantic and or sexual relationships. Instead, the anime highlights it is due to Rei's upbringing and his unawareness of what constitutes a normal life. It is more so about Rei being a killing machine than anything else. But this is unfortunately a narrative we often see in other entertainment media, especially directed towards characters that possess aromantic traits. The erroneous notion that because they are not interested in romance, they are inherently cold and unfeeling, even incapable of love. Since the first episode, even if he is monotonous, Rei is shown to be empathetic. He simply wasn't raised in a household that cultivates the aforementioned trait. Therefore, when he tries to act on it, he's a bit awkward about it. 
Urei also tries, in his own way, to comfort Kazuki whenever the latter is upset or stressed. He may come across as too straightforward, but it is evident he cares deeply about his partner and will try to help despite not being equipped with common nurturing actions and words, something he is shown to learn with time. The anime also tackles the common conflation of aromanticism and killers by having Rei establish his autonomy by abandoning his line of work in favor of properly raising Miri alongside Kazuki. He isn't shown to be suddenly interested in romance and or sex after doing so either. This further drives the point that Rei being an assassin and the way he was raised have no impact on his sexuality. He isn't a romantic and asexual because he is an assassin and is forced to be married to the job. He is a romantic and asexual despite his line of work and how he was brought up. Throughout the anime, there are indications of Kazuki and Rei's synergy when they work together. Kazuki is in charge of planning and Rei is in charge of the execution. Much like their parenting, their harmony at work wasn't immediate. This is where we see Rei's level of intimacy with Kazuki shine. He was thought to be a perfect assassin with no regard for sentimentality and attachments. Rei could have allowed Kazuki to either be discarded as a partner or even die. But Rei surpasses the ingrained training he endured in order to protect Kazuki doing their first missions together until they achieve a stable partnership. Kazuki helped Rei build a home, and Rei helped Kazuki mature into his work qualities, planning, hacking, and execution. Their mishaps begin to occur once again when Miri enters their lives and they must juggle illegal work and parenting. The point is that Kazuki and Rei's relationship was established and flourishing before Miri was part of the equation. What I thought was great in Buddy Daddies is how Kazuki doesn't think twice about referring to Rei as a co-parent. Kazuki will often refer to Miri as our kid, our daughter, and hilariously, our genes at work. Kazuki also only includes Rei to that extent when Rei is ready to accept the role of a father, because Kazuki understands Rei on a deeper level than that of work partners and roommates, he knows Rei can't and shouldn't be forced into the position of a father. In fact, Kazuki only begins to insistently demand Rei to take the responsibility seriously once Rei doesn't refute Miri calling him Rei Papa that Day, papa. When it comes to responsibility, the story does a great job of highlighting how laborious it is to care for a child, especially if one is doing so alone. Episode 7 tackles Kazuki's struggle to simultaneously care for Midi, the apartment, and their work, since Rei isn't accustomed to handling any house chores, and his method of parenting so far has been to be the cool dad. Kazuki leaves the apartment for a total of one day, and it is enough for Rei to comprehend the extent his partner had to go through to care not only for Miri, but for both of them. In anime feminist article, Queer Platonic Relationships and Found Family in Buddy Daddies, Michelle Kirinchanskaya describes the importance of showcasing not only the difficulties in parenting, but also two male characters tackling their responsibility. Because of patriarchy and toxic masculinity, cis men often aren't taught the value of domestic work and childcare. By depicting Kazuki and Rei learning to appreciate those responsibilities, Buddy Daddies is effectively normalizing cis men taking on feminized labor. Because nothing about the scenario, two assassins with tragic backstories spontaneously adopting the child of one of their targets is normal in the first place. This narrative has the opportunity to skew social norms and show its characters finding happiness outside of them. Kazuki and Rei may not have been ready to share their deepest traumas with one another, but it is evident they are close enough to have an idea of what transpired in their respective lives that left them broken. 
and are close enough to respect each other's boundaries in terms of sharing the details. Ray revisits his understanding of what it means to be a parent by comparing his experience being raised by a boss rather than a father to meet his definition of a father, someone who helps you when you're in trouble. Ray's conflict with his father can be interpreted as more than Ray being raised to carry on the legacy of the organization. The choice of words whenever Ray and his father interact is brimming with queer subtext. Ray's father implies he shouldn't be with a man by placing great emphasis on the history of Sua's bloodline and outright says Kazuki's influence on Ray is bad before suddenly threatening him to come back home to take over the organization. This is an unfortunate common narrative that happens to some queer folk, those who have parents who can't accept their children's sexuality and identity because they envision them living within traditional roles. The bad influence arguments as well, if it weren't for this friend or this relationship, you wouldn't be queer. There's also a sprinkle of queer subtext when they're trying to find a daycare that will accept Midi. The first interview fails horrendously as Midi describes the bad business her fathers are involved in. Sure, but before anything else, the interviewer questions the validity of their family when she highlights that they are two fathers. Meanwhile, Miss Anna doesn't care at all if there are two fathers and no mother, or if they are even romantically intertwined. She asks Midi if she loves her fathers, and Midi's answer and happiness are enough for her to consider the trio a family. One of the most important messages Buddy Daddies demonstrates it's that despite the conditions of Kazuki and Rei's upbringing, they can break the cycle of abuse and forgive themselves for past wrongdoings in order to tackle their future as parents, with no lingering regrets, guilt, and resentment. They undeniably have a couple of hiccups here and there, but both agree on one thing. Midi's happiness is what matters the most. In fact, I was pleasantly surprised at how both are portrayed to be extremely sensitive to Midi's necessities and emotions. Whenever she shows distress, sadness, confusion, or anger, the duo quickly notices and discusses possible solutions with one another and with Midi. Kazuki and Rei understand better than anyone what being a child with no autonomy means. They understand that a child isn't their parent's proxy, but rather an individual. And they treat Midi as such by including her in appropriate discussions regarding her problems and possible solutions. They allow Midi to have authority over her own life at a young age by allowing her the option of making choices. Buddy Daddies demonstrate how found families are in fact capable of possessing love, trust, dedication, and ultimately, stability. It demonstrates that platonic relationships can go beyond what constitutes friendship. As I mentioned, the anime could have made better decisions towards the end, more so regarding Midi's mother, but it certainly left a mark in entertainment media as a whole by portraying unconditional love between three people who cross paths in one of the most unconventional ways. It also left a special mark in my heart as a story depicting unconditional love that doesn't impart from romance, and as a story that shows it is possible to regain autonomy and change for the better, no matter how broken the world has left you. The Isaiah Gente! This video is definitely shorter compared to my other two videos, but I tried to make it sweet in order to make up for it. I apologize if I was ranting too much about the things that stress me out in terms of how society views aromantics and asexuals. As someone who is asexual and I am questioning if I am aromantic as well, I just find it exhausting yeah. to have to be questioned at all times. And quite frankly, when it comes to bisexuals, pansexuals, polyamorous, oh god, I could have just sat here and talked about the whole 
issue with uh, people being angry that Kazuki has relations outside of uh, Rei and Midi. And it's like, if he has sexual urges and he cares about sexual urges, then yeah, like, go unwind. But that does not mean that he loves Rei and Midi any less, you know? That does not make their family any less uh, valid. I cannot start. I cannot start, otherwise I'm gonna... Ooh. And the whole Misaki thing, I... It just... It gets me when in anime, like, you have it. You have it. You have it within your reach. Keep it. Keep it, please. Anyway, I just hope that I wasn't ranting for too long, okay? And that I managed to capture how wholesome and lovable and caring Kazuki, Rei, and Miri are. And the success that the anime had with portraying the lovely family that they became. If you like fandom and shipping, I have a video essay where I talk about how capitalism, social isolation, no media literacy, and moral purity affected the way we interact within fandom and how we view shipping. So if that sounds like it's up your alley, please check it out. If you couldn't tell by my surroundings and <laughs> everything related to One Piece, I love One Piece, so I made a video essay where I analyze One Piece through Celtic mythology lens, particularly how the will of the D may be connected to a divine order, and how characters of One Piece fit within the Tuaha de Danan, who are gods, and the Favora, who are evil gods. So if that sounds like it's up your alley, please check it out. Let me know of your thoughts in the comments. Did you enjoy Buddy Daddies? Do you think that Kazuki and Rei are a fair assessment of a, a romantic and a sexual relationship? Did you enjoy the end of the anime or do you feel like it was lacking? Thank you so much for watching and I hope I see you next time. EAE fellow humans, if you like this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe, and please don't forget to check me out on other social media. Ciao! Before I truly end this video, if you care about current events, please stay. I will be leaving a link in the description of this video where you have access to multiple ways in which you can help uh, families in Hussa. Um, either families that need money to buy food. I recently saw that a sack of flour can go up to a thousand dollars. So there's no way that displaced families will be able to pay that for a sack of flour. So if you want to help the people who are starving in Hassa or people who are trying to evacuate with their families, there's a link called Operation Olive Branch, where you can choose the family or person that you want to help in Hassa, and uh, either donating or even if you can just share the uh, link to that operation, it would be great way to get more people to be aware of it. I also provide links to um, other countries who are going through similar situations right uh, so uh, links to Congo Sudan Armenia my own home country Brazil uh, Lebanon and so on and so forth unfortunately as I said in my first video um, I don't want to post things and pretend that there's nothing going on around me I don't want to post things and act like I'm not affected by it. Because I think that it's crazy that some people are unaffected. If you want to hate me for it, okay. If you care about it, please consider visiting the links. Thank you so much if you've watched until the end. Obrigada.